place of power, medieval republic, crusading, fire, renaissance, imprisonments. This is Venice and its amazing palace, the Doge's Palace. <laughs> Welcome to the channel. If you are back, thank you very much for visiting again. If you're new here, please subscribe. Hit that like button if you like the video. Comment down below. Let's get into this. To understand the Doge's Palace, we need to first understand how the Doge's came about and why people started to live on islands on a lagoon next to the Italian mainland. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD, the Lombard Kingdom in the northwest of Italy decided they wanted to expand their territory. So what they did is they went to Veneto, as it's known today, in the northeast of Italy. And the people that were living there were fishermen and salt workers. And they ran away to islands on the lagoon just off of the northeast coast of Italy. This area in the northeast of Italy was controlled by the Byzantine Empire. And for complicated reasons, which I explain in the Hagia Sophia video, um, the Byzantine Empire was like Eastern Rome. By the time that Odezzo, the capital city of Byzantine Veneto, fell to the Lombards in 641, they decided to move their capital city to these islands off the coast of Italy. Now that we know why people were living on these islands on the lagoon uh, just off the coast of Italy, they needed a leader. And in 727, they decided to get away from the Byzantines and elect their own doge, their duke, if you will. And the first duke was elected and his name was Orso. The Byzantines weren't happy about this, and in 751, they took their city over, and eventually there was pro and cons to having the Byzantines in power. So what they did is they re-elected another person to be their doge, Alberio, and he went to the kings of Italy at that time, which were the Franks of Italy, and under King Pippin, he asked for their protection. Finally, by 840, they've gained their own independence and they've established a republic. And their location was so crucial because it was between two or three superpowers of the time. You have the Austrian Habsburgs, the Byzantines, mainland Italy, and the Franks in mainland Italy as well. And this location would make the Venetans fabulously wealthy. There were a number of leading families who then became ennobled. They became the nobles of Venice. And they decided to ensure that the doge was always going to do the correct thing so that everyone, i.e. the nobles, would become even more wealthy. At this time, what was known as Venice was just a collection of a whole lot of random islands. And the doge was elected by all of these islands. But the Rialto Islands decided they were going to become their own city and have their doge lead them. So this is when the real Venice that we know of today comes into place. To make their city even richer, the doge Enrico Dondolo in 1002 AD decided he was going to go crusading, the fourth crusade. That's the crusade that never arrived in the Holy Land that they were supposed to go to in Jerusalem. Instead, they pillaged and looted their way all the way to Constantinople. When they got there, they looted and pillaged some more. Eventually, he would die and he's buried in the Hagia Sophia even today. By 1032, Doge Domenico Flavinico was elected as the Doge of Venice, and he wanted to make sure that Venice was developing, making sure that it was making political gains and being democratic. So he said that the Doge should always be elected through popular vote. When I say popular vote, I mean the nobles. And when I say the nobles, I mean just a specific amount of nobles who were friends with the Doge, who kind of paid him a little bit. Before the Doge's Palace was a real palace that we know today, in 1095, St. Mark's Basilica was finally finished to be the symbol of Venice. Now, St. Mark's was based off Byzantine architecture and styles, and the Byzantines and the Venetians had quite a turbulent history. They weren't friends, and then they were friends, but what happened is Venice decided to have a very strong navy, and they went to war against Genoa another Italian state, and they made sure that they were going to beat Genoa, which they did, so that they could be the number one trade port in Europe, so that they could become even wealthier. Now, like I said before, the palace wasn't quite a palace yet. It was more the Doge's home, but by 1340, this would change. The Doge's palace would become amazingly powerful and amazingly beautiful. 
And it needed to be so big because it needed to hold all the space for the council members or the nobles that were making up the government. By this time, Venice had a slight whiff of imperialism and they decided they wanted to expand their territories. So they went into mainland Italy and did away with the feudal lords that were there and they expanded throughout Italy, which includes today's Veneto and Fruli as well. And by 1420, they were at their very zenith of wealth and power in the region. The Doge at this time was immensely wealthy and powerful. And of course, that meant having an immensely beautiful palace to go along with him. But in 1438, this great Gothic building was set ablaze and burnt to a crisp. Now, this wasn't a terrible catastrophe because, of course, they were wealthy, so they could rebuild, and it was the Renaissance. The Doge employed Antonio Rizzio to raise the structure off of the floor of the Grand Canal, and he employed artists like Bellini to ensure that the interior was lavishly decorated and amazingly adorned. Now, Grand Tour uh, people that were coming all the way from England at that time, when they would go into the Doge's palace, said that it was the most lavish and luxurious place in Europe. Unfortunately, as so often throughout history, the building caught fire once more, and in 1547 it was burnt down, but then they rebuilt it, they refurbished it. But, you guessed it, in 1577 it burnt down again, and this time it took with it all, or nearly all, of the Renaissance artists' work. They decided to rebuild the palace in the Gothic style, with a little touch of Renaissance architecture and a vague hint of classicalism as well that we can see with the famed Bridge of Sighs. The Bridge of Sighs was actually built in the year 1600, but it only got its name in the 1900s by the famous Lord Byron. He was the writer, and he named it so because convicts who were coming from the courts in the palace to the prison in uh, on the other side of the water would have their last glimpse of freedom and of Venice through the Bridge of Sighs. If we look at the palace from the outside, it is actually the oldest part of the palace, and it is facing the Grand Canal and the lagoon so that the Doge could keep an eye on whatever was coming in and out of his republic. When you step through the Porta della Carta, which is the a main ceremonial entrance place of the palace, which was built by Renaissance artists, uh, Giovanni and Bortolano Bon in 1442, you actually go into a courtyard, which is between St. Mark's Basilica and the palace. And this is where the church and the state meet. When you go inside, what are you going to see? Well, there's so much to see that I'm only going to give you a sort of greatest hits, in my opinion, just because there's too much for me to talk about. In the Doge's palace, you will go into the Doge's apartments, which means that you'll see the Scarlet Chamber, the colour of the Doge. Now, this colour is very unique for Doges and royalty in general at that time, the Scarlet colour, bright and really, really welcoming on the eyes. Uh, then you'll go into the Scudo Room, the Coat of Arms Room, where you would have the reigning Doge's Coat of Arms. The Doge's Palace actually holds one of the largest rooms in Europe, even to this day, and it's called the Great Council Chamber. It's where the council was running the Republic, making sure everything was going all right. And talking about size, if you look on the top of the Great Council Chamber, you will see a giant oil painting, Tintoretto's Paradise. It's one of the biggest oil paintings on a single canvas ever done, and it is supposed to represent heaven on earth so that the councillors can make the correct decisions and help them in the governing. If you go through the entire palace, you will eventually get to the Bridge of Sighs and go into the prison like so many prisoners did before. These prisoners would often come from the Chamber of Torment, which was a completely dark room, and you would be there waiting for your time to be questioned and interrogated. But you would hear everything. You would hear your fellow inmates being tortured. So as soon as the prison guards would come in, they would tie you up and try and make you confess to your crimes through torture. The truth, however, is that as soon as they would come and interrogate you, you would often immediately give away uh, all your secrets and confess to any crimes that you had done because you had heard the screams of these fellow inmates. But they 
actually weren't fellow inmates. They were paid actors, so they were using psychological torture already back then. One of the most famous people imprisoned in this uh, prison was Giacomo Casanova in 1755. And I assume that you would think he's imprisoned because of adulterous acts, but he wasn't. He was actually imprisoned because of his fascination of witchcraft. If we go back and have a look at the scooter room, you'll actually see that there is a coat of arms on the wall, and that is the last doge, Doge Ludovico Manin. And he was the last doge of the Republic, but why did it come to an end? Well, the Republic fell to perhaps one of the greatest generals of all time, Napoleon Bonaparte in 1797, where he used the palace as his own base in Venice and then left it into a state of disrepair. When Italy was finally unified by the Savoy royal family, uh, the building was restored. And thankfully, they took a whole lot of the precious items that were in uh, the palace to the Museo della Opera for safekeeping. Ever since then, the palace has been in the Italian state's hands. What's crazy to think is that a group of fishermen decided to run away from a Lombard culture to create their own republic, and this republic would last longer than the entire Western Roman Empire, over a thousand years. They had their own democracy, they were their own republic, they used their own checks to make sure that they became fabulously wealthy and creating a unique place on this earth, which I suggest you should go and visit. Thank you very much for watching the video. I really do appreciate it if you've got this far. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed it. Comment down below of what you want to hear about next. There's so much to learn about. Let me know what you want to learn about. Subscribe if you haven't as well. There's going to be links coming up. And so hit the links to go look at the other videos. And as always, the more you know.